try this again. Sorry about all of that. As I said, we at NOAA you shouldn't use a Zoom except um, for looking at it. So this, this might be the issue here. Um, so Air Maps, as you mentioned earlier, is a campaign that we at NOAA OER, so CSL that I'm working in is part of OER, so the Office of Atmospheric Research, is planning on doing for the next few years, maybe even into 2028. AMAP stands for Airborne Rem and Remote Sensing Methane and Air Pollutant Surveys. So this is, this is a mission plan to really look at oil and gas methane emissions over the next few years. I have the outline of my talk here. First, I'm gonna start with some previous measurements and then describe air maps, the general layout that we have for the plan that we have from 2024 to 26, then discuss the more uh, future plans, 25 and 26, and discuss measurements that we have already done uh, in Colorado and Utah. And I see there's a typo. This should be 2024 here for Colorado and Utah. So here are the objectives uh, for air maps. And I kind of read them here, but the first one is really evaluating U.S. oil and gas emissions. So establish a current top-down evaluation of U.S. oil and gas methane and air pollutant emissions. Number two is about a tiered integrated observing system. So demonstrate the use and value of the tiered integrated satellite airborne and ground sensing greenhouse gas observing system. Third one's about um, satellites. There's a lot of uh, civilian and commercial spaceborne remote sensing methods these days that give us long-term monitoring for methane. So we want to evaluate those methods. Number four is quantifying greenhouse gases and pollutant emissions. So these pollutants, of course, have impacts on the downstream areas, especially in urban areas. So we're gonna look at always urban areas and oil and gas regions at the same time in, in our campaign. So I do wanna start with um, the previous oil and gas aircraft measurements. You can see here on this slide, two campaigns that we did in the past. So one was called Cenex in 2013, the other one Songnex in 2015. And we used a large research aircraft to look at a lot of different oil and gas basins. And on this slide here on the right, you have a, a blow up of the area around the Haynesville Shale. And you can see here the flight track on top of the, the different sources that you have in this region color-coded by methane. So the flight track's color-coded by methane, and if you know how mass balance works, so you measure the concentrations upwind and downwind, the difference gives you emissions in, in between. We also did eta covariance, so where you basically look at the wind. I'll talk about the methods in a second in more detail. But with this, we quantify methane and other pollutants in this specific region. So this is a basin-wide estimate of emissions. And on, here's a paper from Jeff Peichel from 2015 that gives you the whole basin emission estimates for this Haynesville that I just showed here in the middle, but also Fayetteville, Marcellus. We also did Denver Julesburg and so on and, and other papers. And all of this then was used in this Alvarez 2018 summary that's shown here on the left, um, where he, he compiled a lot of uh, the different measurements that have been available at that time. And the middle plot here shows you what you kind of expect uh, from all these basins, that a basin-wide top-down estimate always has somewhat higher emissions than what you get from the bottom-up inventories. Bottom-up inventories do seem to still be missing some of the, the sources. Um, since we have a large aircraft, it's not only methane we measure. We really measure the whole series of compounds that can be emitted and also can be produced downwind of these oil and gas regions. With this nice payload, I'll like describe that for air maps here in a second, but you can do a lot of other things than just measuring emissions. For example, source apportionment. I think most of you are familiar with the methane-ethane ratios that you get from oil and gas compared to like landfills or um, other, other sources like coal mines. So with this, set of VOCs that we have, so 
the co-emitted species, we can do source apportionment. And this is done here on the right for the LA basin, for example. So this is the source apportionment of methane. Um, of course, the LA basin is, is rather complicated. So there's a lot of sources playing a role here and, and uh, we can do this for all kinds of species. On the left, you see how much species are co-emitted with the methane. So what's plotted here is basically the methane to VOC ratio and color and size coded by that as well. So this is measurements from 2013. So that's a while ago, the Bakken still had a lot of uh, co-emitted species uh, with the methane. So the ratio was uh, almost 50% of other compounds coming out with the methane. And in other areas, the Marcellus that is very dry, there's very few other VOCs uh, co-emitted with, with methane. So these were the types of measurement we've done by now almost a decade ago or even more than a decade ago when we do this again. So here is the recent trends. This is from a paper, Lou et al. I, I assume most of you are familiar with, with this, this type of um, methane trends, but the emissions have been relatively constant or somewhat going down in places, but the methane intensity definitely has been steadily declining, even though that the production has been go, uh, going up very, very rapidly over the past um, decade or two. The yeah, intensity is going down. So we're the, the trend's going in the right direction. So let's, let's start with air maps. I think you are all aware that one measurement alone will not give you the, the full picture of the methane emissions and trends that you want. So what we are trying to do here is a tiered observing system for emissions quantification. And this is the picture that we put up as the, the front page of air maps where we describe the tiered observing system. So I said, NOAA OER, that's us. We are planning to do a three to five year deployment of the twin other and P3 aircraft. So if you see those two aircraft in the middle of the, the plot, the heavy lift and the light aircraft, that is us. Then we're working together with the satellite branch of NOAA, that's NESDIS. So that's the top of the graph. So the satellite remote sensing. And then we work with a lot of other partners to do the, the airborne remote sensing uh, flights of methane. We do mobile labs and, and uh, ground site measurements ourselves, but we're gonna partner with a lot of people from, from different agencies and academic partners and industries and other stakeholders to really get to this, this full range, big picture. Um, this is one of the most used plots recently in, in methane emissions or methane observations, I think. This is, this is the, the growing fleet of satellite remote sensing of greenhouse gases, so methane specifically. And a lot of these um, satellites that are on here are actually from the, the private sector, not just public. It's like NOAA or NASA satellites. But there is, for example, MethaneSat, GHGSat, Carbon Mapper, and GOES ABI, that's, that's one of our own from NOAA. So that's a stationary um, measurement, a geostationary measurement. A lot of these um, private sector companies have a satellite and also um, remote sensing with aircraft. And uh, throughout AirMaps, we are trying to partner with all these, these commercial um, groups as well and, and trying to, to help and verify their, their products. So here are the airborne remote sensing platform, uh, airborne, not the remote sensing platform, the airborne in situ platforms that uh, we will deploy ourselves from NOAA CSL. Um, and that was the middle of our tiered observing system, right? The in situ platforms. On the left is the NOAA P3, which is a heavy lift research aircraft that you can stuff full of instrumentation. Of course, not only methane, all the co-emitted species, all, all the species that can be produced downwind as the secondary compounds, and also aerosols, black carbon is of course important for flares. So we'll have a very full picture of, of what you can expect. And of course that includes um, all the, the co-emitted species that are tracers for different sources of methane. And also air pollutants like HAPs, so hazardous air pollutants and so on. On the right is the twin otter aircraft that of course is much smaller with a smaller range as well. That gives us, of course, methane and some of the co-emitted species and some of the, the main air quality uh, components. So one thing that's important to point out here, on both aircraft, we will have a Doppler wind LIDAR. That is, of course, very, very important to know the wind fields when you do a mass balance method. So you need to know the wind 
as good as you can to get the good mass balance out. Um, so with these two aircraft, we're going to try to cover the whole US or most of the US within the next uh, two to three years. As I said, 24 has already happened. So that's shown here in purple. So we use the twin otter and lots of other uh, assets that I'll explain later to look at um, Denver and the Denver Julesburg Basin, <laughs> and then um, Salt Lake City and Uinta. So I said earlier that we always would like to look at uh, oil and gas and urban pairs. So this is what we did in 24 already and continuing that in 25. So that's in green on the right side of the plot here, we'll look at Baltimore and the Marcellus or Appalachia. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in detail later on. So 2026 is then the big year for the large research aircraft. So you see those those red line, the small red lines on this graph here is from these, these previous campaigns that I showed you. And that shows you pretty well what we, what we can do with this aircraft in, in one campaign. And we're really trying to cover a lot of um, the oil and gas basin regions that, um, that, shows, uh, that goes into this plot here. So within these uh, campaigns, we would like to cover 90% of the total oil and gas production and emissions in the US within um, 2026. Um, and I'm showing the time series of the oil production here on the right. So as we all know, oil and gas production is going up and the Songnex and Cenex measurements that I presented earlier have been in the time where we have had about half the, the production that we have now. So Cenex, uh, MAPS seems like uh, the perfect timing 10 years later. Of course, industry and a lot of things have changed. So 10 years is a really good uh, time frame in between campaigns like this, it seems to us. So what we want to do is targets uh, for oil and gas. So we, we put them into tiers where we really look at the, the more important areas more often and the somewhat less important areas less frequently. So for example, the Permian with the largest emissions is the one that is definitely tier one where we put a lot of our flights into to getting that done. So is the Eagle Ford. Let's say as an example, the San Juan where there's very little uh, current development going on. This is probably one of the tier three uh, basins where we know the emissions are smaller and they're probably also um, going away over time anyway. So, but we also have additional targets. So besides the regional service that we will do with this, we also want to look at the point sources, such as compressor stations, liquefaction, but also at pipelines and pipeline junctions that have been shown recently to have large emissions. Other targets are then coal mines, landfills, CAFOs, as the opportunity arises, and the air quality implications that you have of all of this. And again, I mentioned the urban targets. So all these oil and gas emissions do have influence on urban areas and their air quality. So we're gonna look at Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio specifically, especially when we fly with the P3. I actually forgot to mention on this graph here that the goal is to fly out of Austin, Texas for, with the P3 and the Twin Otter in 2026. So the big year will be centered around uh, Texas and all the surrounding um, states and the offshore oil and gas as well. Um, so here are the methods listed what we're going to use to quantify the emissions. On the left is mass balance. I, I mentioned that a couple times already and here it's shown in a little graph where you basically measure the upwind of a certain area, ideally also the center of it and then downwind and the difference uh, in the concentration of methane can be used to estimate or calculate the emissions that have taken place in between those, those lines that you flew. And I mentioned again here, the Doppler wind glider is really important because when you fly along, you do get uh, the winds in, in detail. And to demonstrate this, I have a plot here of the, the wind glider. These are flights that we have done this, this summer 2024 in Denver. What you see on the right at about 2000 meters altitude, this is where the plane flew, looking up and down 
measuring the wind and the boundary layer at the time. So you do know the transport of methane within the area that you're flying in very, very well. So going back to the, this plot of the methods, so mass balance is the bread and butter, but eddy covariance is also really important. Eddy covariance basically uses very fast measurements of wind and concentrations of trace gases. So if the wind is up and the concentration is higher than when the wind is down, then you have a flux that's positive, so an emission, and if it's the other way around, it will be a deposition. And you have to me measure wind and concentrations faster than one hertz. But with that, you can really, within the footprint of the aircraft, you can uh, calculate emissions as well. So this is method number two. The third one is using a tracer, a tracer relationships and inventories of compounds that we know very well. Here is shown an example of methane to CO ratios from an urban area. CO, we know, we think we know the emissions very well, and then the ratio will give you a methane emission as well, simply. And inverse modeling uh, is something that a lot of groups do. We do this here in house as well. This is shown again, the same flight as I used earlier is the flight track. And then you can calculate back how many, uh, what the emissions were along the way of the back trajectories that make the measurements or the concentration measurements that we do on the aircraft. So four different methods and hopefully they will give us the same results. So I'm going slightly backwards in time. This was a lot of the larger concept and what we're going to do in 2026 a lot. So those plans, of course, it's, it's a little far out, are not perfectly developed. More developed is what we're going to do next year in 25. And I'm showing a few slides here of, of next upcoming summer measurements. And then at the end, I will talk about 2024, where we actually have some measurements and I'll, I'll, I can actually show some results already. So then pair for urban and uh, oil and gas is Baltimore Marcellus in 2025. So somewhere between June and mid-August, we are going to do this campaign. The main aircraft platform from NOAA will be the twin auto aircraft again um, and other assets. They are shown here. So we, this is a large coordinated activity as well. There's actually a lot of stuff going on in and around the Baltimore area with a lot of ground sites. For example, DOE Courage or BSEC is the, there. NIST has an urban test bed in this area looking at greenhouse gas emissions from Baltimore as well. And then we'll partner heavily with NASA. To, they are going to provide their remote sensing assets. So for example, Everest will be flying likely on the B200 and then they will have some flights on uh, the B2, uh, different B200 to do in situ measurements. And then hopefully the, the Gulf 3 and GS3 will fly as well, have methane air and the halo um, uh, methane LIDAR flying as well. So again, this is, uh, this is a pretty large um, group of people working on, on this um, project coming up. Here are a couple of examples of, of plans that, that we already have. On the left, you see the mass balance flights of this um, urban area at the bottom that we that we can do fly around Washington, Baltimore, upwind, downwind, and, and get the mass balance of the urban area. In the middle bottom plot, these are typical flights, what, we, what you would do for an air quality study. And on the right um, shows you basically how we would do a mass balance in the Marcellus region. So this is, this is the, the big plan for the, the NOAA assets in the, in the aircraft. Here is uh, shown the NOAA Air Resources car or NOAA ARC that's led by Xingrong Ren. And they have done a lot of measurements in the Baltimore area with this, with this van. And they're shown here where you can measure a lot of, uh, again, the greenhouse gases and, um, <clears throat> and air quality uh, compounds as well. So there's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of things done in the DC Baltimore area and then we'll, we'll keep the trend going for 2025, but really include the Marcellus as well, besides the, the air quality implications that, that have been done in the past year. So the last half or about second half of the talk is about AirMAPS 2024 
Colorado and Utah. I actually saw Ben Himmel on this call. He is from CDPAG. That's one of that's the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. They are one of the sponsors of AMBAC. So that's the Airborne Methane Mass Balance Experiment in Colorado. Thanks, Ben. And we have a very nice collaboration with CDPAG here to, to uh, have been able to pull off this, this great uh, experiment here in the summer in Colorado. And then I will talk about USOS. So that's the Utah Summer Ozone Study that also happened this, this past summer right after AMBAC. So those are the, the two pairs of urban and um, oil and gas again. So AMBEC was Denver and the Denver Julesburg Basin. So again, we had a large group of people uh, together with the NOAA Twin Otter as the NOAA asset. The NASA King Air was there with the every uh, three methane imaging, ground sites, mobile labs, and, and all kinds of assets. Again, we worked with NOAA NESDIS for the greenhouse gases. And all these assets are basically coming back to this tiered observing system. And what's, what we have um, operating in 24 was, was is circled here in red now. So for example, GHG set borders, then the remote sensing King Air, and, and so on. So I'm not gonna talk about the air quality part today. The campaign is very recent and we don't have results yet. I just want to have this one plot up here, which is the Colorado Front Range remains in non-attainment of ozone. A lot of other places in the US actually are dropping consistently. Their, the ozone and the non-attainment areas are, are shrinking for ozone, but the Front Range has been staying pretty constant. And it has been suggested in this Langford et al. paper from, from our group here at NOAA CSL, that oil and gas development and the emissions could play a role in keeping that, that higher ozone going over the years. So let's start with the oil and gas emissions in um, Colorado. And again, like in a national trend, you see that the um, production has been growing really rapidly over the past uh, decade and a half or, or so while the emissions have come down. The denver Julesburg Basin is probably the best studied area of all the oil and gas basins. And that you see in this, this right plot here, all these measurements that are summarized in that Need et al. paper, um, showing clearly the trend um, of um, lowering emissions over time. But you also see that there's a large range um, of emission estimates over the last past few years. And is this really variability? Is this um, uncertainties in measurements? And hopefully our air maps campaigns over this ne next three years will, will shed some light on this as well. I, I talked about Avris 3 a couple times already. So this is NASA GPL partnering with us. Andrew Thorpe is the PI of this. And they have been flying high over the DJ base and rastering this whole area and looking at methane plumes. Um, and that is shown here as well in this plot where you see these blue lines on the map here over the DJ basin is those, those remote sensing. Then the twin otter flights you can see in this, this black to yellow red color, color coded by methane is, is that flight. And then the other color is the mobile lab on the ground. So these assets were all in the field at the same time. And on the right, you see a time series of methane from in this case from the twin other aircraft and you see quite some some large enhancements the methane ethane ratio is shown here as well and it looks like uh, a lot of this is is from oil and gas um you notice in this twin otter color coding that the right side that's the upwind side if you look at the wind direction is much lower than the downwind side and again mass balance you basically take the difference calculated by the wind um, you can get the emission side so that's our mass balance method. But I wanna also point you towards this middle part of this plot where there's a lot of intense measurements and you can see some circles, so that's spirals around one point source. And that is shown in this graph here. So we actually managed to have coincident measurements of agriculture measurement, um, methane in this case. So on the left is the twin order and the middle is the remote sensing with average three and then the right is the GHG set tasking that we've done at the exact same time. The red square that you see is the same area 
so the 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 whole area of each plot is a little different because um, that that's how the the ranges of these these detection methods. Again, on the left, these are the circles flying around this one facility. You see the methane concentration is really high downwind of it. Then you use the mass balance method and calculate uh, the emission flux of methane from this one point source. Everest does the same thing. And GHG said, um, of course, their methods are very different than the, ma the mass balance methods, but they give you um, a methane emission as well. I don't have results yet for the Everest 3 numbers, but the uh, uh, mass balance method and the GHG set method, the uncertainties actually overlap, but they do show quite some difference here as well. And um, this is first results. We'll see what the final data will hold and also if this is the same for many other of the point sources that we're going to look at. So lots more to come in this, in this type here. So here are the results of the DJ and the Uinta Basin mass balance. I'll talk about the Uinta a little more in detail later on. But the DJ Basin um, has been targeted six times with the mass balance. And the average is shown here. And you can see that it's quite a range as well. And again, I really need to point out here, this is very, very preliminary. This is not verified. This is done with the standard quick method. Um, but we do have first numbers. And this is how these first numbers from the DJ Basin fit into these previous results that I've showed earlier. Again, the error bar is still pretty large. We're going to work out if we have the same areas covered for, for all the other measurements and so on. But it is in the same ballpark of the somewhat higher emissions that we've seen recently. And again, with a large error bar. Again, lots of work to come, but this, this is the type of results that, that we can have from, from this uh, past summer study. Um, last, I'm going to talk about the USOS study, so the Utah Summer Ozone Study. So that was done right after the DJ and the Denver areas. We went over to Salt Lake City and then flew also in the Uinta Basin at that time. Again, with the Twin Otter, somewhat less partnerships with NASA and the remote sensing aircraft, but a lot of partnerships with people on the ground. And that's shown here in this uh, more complicated picture. Kerry Womack is the PI of this study here. And I'm not going to go into detail of what we had, but there's a lot of um, measurements together with people in Salt Lake City, groups from the University of uh, Utah and, and others working together on, on making uh, mobile lab measurements, ground side measurements, and also the flights with the twin honor. So I showed the results earlier in that, that table already. Here is how one of these mass balance flights looked in the Uinta Basin. Again, you see the upwind and downwind concentrations are very, very different, higher than in the DJ Basin, actually. Methane, ethane is nicely correlated again. There's few other sources in this area. The denver Julesburg Basin has a lot of agriculture and other sources, but Uinta is really mostly oil and gas. And as I said, I showed the results earlier of the, the aggregate of this um, study as well. Um, the last couple of slides are about the urban methane as well that we have uh, looked at during USOS. Uh, um, on this plot, you show, see on the left the twin otter and the mobile labs and color coded by methane. And again, the twin otter <coughs> methane concentration is concentration is shown here on the right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so here is a, a more detailed look at these point sources that you see in a city. Of course, in a city, you have landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And these are marked up here with these, these nice uh, yellow and red stars. And the mobile lab drive track color and size coded by methane is, is shown here as well. And you do see downwind of these point sources. You do see clear and strong methane enhancements, as we all expect, of course, right? Um, but a lot of other sources, we know what the co-emitted species are. For example, from oil and gas, we know methane comes with ethane, and lots of other hydrocarbons as well. Um, a lot of the coal mines do not come with much more than methane. And we would like to use, look at tracers of other compounds, such as VOCs, to see if we can do better source apportionment on 
landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And what we found in these measurements here in Utah, that there's some sulfur compounds emitted with uh, the emissions of methane in the wastewater treatment plant. So methane thiol, you can see the, the, the what is this, this yellowish mustard kind of color definitely shows um, high emissions of methane thiol together with methane from one of these wastewater treatment plants. And this, it seems like there's also a little bit of a, a DMS coming out with that. And a, so dimethyl sulfide, and also it comes from the Great Salt Lake in this area, but there might be some sulfur emissions coming with, with um, wastewater treatment. On the right, you see the landfills. Again, methane thiol, there seems to be some correlation with these uh, landfills, but also with D5 siloxane. So D5 siloxane is actually a volatile chemical product that is in shampoos and deodorants, so personal care products. And of course, these personal care products get uh, thrown away the rest of the, the uh, bottles. And we do see some of those emissions of, of a very different type of source uh, from a landfill as well. So changing gears to 2028 potentially. So this is something that we may do in 28 um, as part of air maps as well, looking at wintertime urban areas as well in the Southwest. And you may know that the EPA has recently changed uh, their annual standard from 12 microgram down to nine. And Stella et al shows here which, which areas could go into non-attainment with that. A lot of these areas are in the winter time, and a lot of these areas are in areas where there's also some oil and gas exploration. So, um, and uh, other methane sources like, like, such as agricultural sources. So we're gonna look at winter time um, air quality issues as well in 2028. So I wanna end with putting this last, this plot up here again from air maps, the large scale plan for the next few years. And I'm happy to take any questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Karsten.